All right, well, uh, I'm Mike Conover. I'm a, a data scientist at LinkedIn in the data products group. Uh, we build machine learning technology that powers a lot of the viral loops you see on the site. Um, I work with the skills and endorsements data uh, at length and all of the interesting things uh, that we have to say and know about people uh, who are engaged professionally uh, online. And so this talk is going to be about the power of uh, visualization as a, a central component of a lot of the mach machine learning workflows uh, that are in place in, at LinkedIn and trying to understand how uh, you're sort of visualization is able to give you a deeper insight into uh, the structure, the high dimensional structure of the data you're working with. And so my background is in a field called complex systems analysis, which basically tries to understand uh, systems whose behavior in the aggregate is different uh, and more than the behavior of any individual component. And so you see this, and I mean for me, like it's a truly transcendental experience to watch a very large flock of birds. And as it moves, you see this hidden structure shimmering beneath the surface. And there are a lot of systems that exhibit this character. And it's, it's beautiful and timeless and very inspiring. And I think that with respect to uh, our visual faculties, you, you look at the vascularity in this leaf, you could describe a summary statistic uh, that characterizes that fractal. And I could tell that to you in a couple bytes of information, but that's a very different experience from seeing it in practice. And, and likewise, this, this, I mean, all of these things have structure that you immediately apprehend when you, when you see it. And so when we interact with technology, we create these digital trace data that allow us to take a, a similar perspective on phenomena that unfold on a global scale. And this is a very special time, I think, in the science because we're beginning to uh, study societal systems in the way that we study the cell. And here you have uh, traffic flows through Lisbon, Portugal. And this has that vascular structure and you can see uh, where the thoroughfares are and here's the, here's the old city and, and this is GPS data instrumented from taxi cabs and you immediately uh, apprehend the, the flow of the city and the rhythm of the city and this is a, an event that's unfolding over many, many weeks and um, I think that with respect to machine learning, uh, you know, to see is to understand and that you have uh, distributions in your data that uh, are often surprising and relationships that are non-intuitive. And so with uh, visualization, you, you accomplish a number of things. And before I go on, are we doing all right in the back now? Is this distance good? All right. Uh, you get a lot of leverage on problems that really matter. Uh, I think, so I've got a friend on the Google Crawl team who uh, asks as a, a thought exercise for one to imagine. So who here has seen Howl's Moving Castle? A couple of people, you should all see Howl's Moving Castle first. Um, but imagine if the software that you built had a physical manifestation. What that would look like, the artifact that is the, the series of pulleys and levers and feed belts and, and infrastructure that manages and, and transforms the data that you deal with. Um, systems have, you know, uh, s the systems that we study have this kind of, for me, a very geometric structure. And so the extent to which you're able to effectively perform your job, which is providing insight and predictive analytics on, my job is providing uh, predictions about the world, uh, that's very closely tied to how realistic my mental model is. That, that sort of abstract geometry of the system that I study. And so visualization uh, puts into very uh, crisp focus the, the structure of these systems. Uh, additionally, you're able to verify your assumptions much more effectively in the sense that um, like a lot, you know, we like regression models assume normality and I work with social networks and long tail distributions are, are the law of the land when it comes to social networks. And so understanding how features in your models are distributed and how their relationships uh, 
are structured is, is super important. And so, to the or, I mean, you can imagine like when you're doing joins, you know, if you're instrumenting every step of your pipeline uh, effectively, you will see very quickly when you're dropping a lot of data or you're getting suddenly a, a very zero loaded uh, output. And that lets you shorten your iteration cycles because you're failing early in the pipeline. And that allows you to debug much more effectively. And so one of the points that I'll touch on again and again is this idea that visualization in your workflow should be latent and pervasive. It should be very low friction. Uh, and it should just be happening at basically every important checkpoint in your processing pipeline. From the realistic, from the improved mental models derives improved per predictive performance. And so this is, I mean, it, it just, you just understand what the features are. You see these novel relationships and you have to understand in a system where the information is stored. Um, and you're able to leverage that when you see the structure. Uh, and that leads, of course, to a deeper understanding of the business, which leads to product insights, which you know, is, is sort of a virtuous cycle, self-catalyzing. And then finally, your ability to communicate with non I mean, for me, like, engaging with non-technical stakeholders is a pretty important part of the job. And so to the extent that you are able to concisely and clearly communicate what it is that's happening, um, I think you're hard pressed to do better than visualization. Uh, so I mean, there are a lot, obviously, a lot of reasons that you want to do this in your work. So I'll touch on four principal components, if you will, of why uh, visualization uh, of, of the kinds of roles visualization plays in our work. So the first is hypothesis generation. Uh, the second is feature development. The third is model fitting and evaluation. And then the fourth is, is around workflow tooling. And so I'll, I'll structure the talk along these four dimensions. So this is a, a screen cap from an older project that I worked on during my uh, doctorate work at Indiana. And so the idea here is to take, we had a, a, the garden hose uh, from Twitter, which is a 10% streaming sample of everything that Twitter sees. And the idea is to uh, detect propaganda campaigns as they're happening. So you can imagine that it's very easy, uh, because it's so simple to create accounts on social media, to have a network of coordinated actors who are all centrally controlled and trying to create the illusion of consensus around gun control or a certain product. You can imagine governments or corporations engaging in this kind of behavior. And so, this was the research uh, statement for the program. And as part of that, we created this system that would just capture memes and visualize their network structure. And out of this, uh, I mean, he here you can see, uh, I can give you all the summary statistics in the world, but this is something of a shadow with respect to here for the White House. I mean, this, this, is, the, this is the chattering class, like writ large. Likewise, uh, with this RSVP meme, this was uh, a promoter for a nightclub. And you begin to understand when you see this what kind of uh, statistical discriminants might help you tell the difference between, in this case, a persuasion campaign and in here, uh, organic uh, complex information diffusion networks. Uh, this has a very regular structure. You have all of these accounts targeting uh, I mean, presumably potential customers, and then pretending to speak with one another. And so this regularity uh, can help us distinguish between these two types of networks. But, and so this, this was the, the crux of that problem. In the course of creating, uh, in bulk, uh, these visualizations, another interesting pattern emerged. And it, it catalyzed a hypothesis that, that, I mean, basically became my dissertation. Uh, you see here this bi-clustered structure in these networks where you have two groups of people who are, uh, so to clarify, each point is a person and an edge between them is drawn in blue if they retweet one another and in orange if they mention one another. And so here you have two groups of people who are preferentially retweeting one another. And so these are political topics. And when we aggregate across all of these networks, a very clear picture emerges and you have partisans on each side who are only engaging with content that reflects their ideological values, but who uh, have a, a cross-ideological discourse in the form of mentions. And it turns out that this uh, tends to be partisan flame baiting. And, I mean, surprise, surprise. Uh, and you can cluster this network, 
And now we have a, a, a way to predict uh, who is uh, a partisan, and you can uh, instrument uh, their speech activity and understand what they're talking about. You can do named entity recognition to see who are the people that are most popular among left-leaning individuals who have talked about abortion, or event detection, or identify the policy topics that each group cares about, or, or study which, one, which group is more active and more engaged on the platform. And so in the process of creating uh, a workflow that had visualization at its heart and that as the information was coming in, we were just visualizing everything that made sense to visualize. We uh, had an insight that was um, as interesting, if not more so, than, than the one that we originally set out to uh, understand. And so I think uh, to the extent that you are able to create workflows where uh, you're visualizing at every uh, checkpoint, uh, you, you can really develop deep insights into to what's happening in your business or in your research. Um, so in just a, can you give me a heads up when I'm like halfway through and then maybe at 15 and five? So I wanna clarify, uh, so this, this is really intuitive, uh, but I think it's useful in the sake of transparency and just to, I like it when I hear what other people are doing because it helps me sort of check what I'm doing. Uh, the basic workflow structure that, that I'm talking about here um, looks like this. And so, of course, at LinkedIn, we use Hadoop uh, quite extensively. Um, and so we have very large volumes of data uh, stored on the grid. And we downsample representative, uh, you know, let's say between a million and 10 million rows um, onto local machines. And then we analyze these in R. So you take this local sample, and then you have these two stages, feature development and model fitting. Uh, Feature development, of course, feeds into model fitting. And then as you are engaged in each of these processes, you uh, pass the data through what I call an in, a visualization battery. And so a battery is a group of related uh, processes or objects uh, that operate on that data and create uh, a visually consistent set of plots that uh, you can compare from, uh, uh, from you know, time A and time B. And so You'll, you'll see here that we check these into Git repositories, and this serves a couple useful functions. Um, the first is that it lets you rewind the clock. So if I, uh, of course up here, be above the grid storage is all of our distributed processing pipeline. If I change how I'm doing a join, or a filter, or if some ETL process goes haywire, um, it is useful as I resample to be able to look at what my data looked like uh, two weeks ago to be able to say, well, <laughs> it was different. It was, in fact, different. I don't, I'm not just concerned. Um, I know that this same plot two weeks ago looked different. Um, and then it also lets you, in checking these into Git repositories, share with colleagues. And so we, of course, have uh, internal wikis and all sorts of platforms for sharing uh, product insights. But I, by and large, would not hang my hat on most of the statistical charts I, pr I produce. It, it's highly likely that at some point in the workflow, there's a bug. That's just a, a reality, but my teammates, you know, the six people I work with closely, need to see what's going on. And so by having, being able to control access through the Git repository, you're able to share insights and, you know, write a LaTeX document that presents some of these pictures. Um, and I know, you know, I know that Notebook, Python Notebook does some of this, but I, this is a workflow that works for us. Um, and so alternatively, like at, at the end, you can then push your uh, the output of your model through an, a viewer, which is uh, something I'll touch on a bit later. Um, but this is a way for non-technical users to engage with the data and understand what you're doing. Um, so just to clarify what I think is a, a pretty useful design pattern, and it, I mean truly intuitive. I don't think that this is revelatory, but it's nice to see it. Um, a battery looks something like, so I use ggplot2, and like that is the correct answer to the question of how do you plot your data. Um, uh, and my code tends to look like this, um, where you're, you're reading, uh, you know, I, I have this convenience library of utility functions. Um, you read uh, arguments off the command line where I'm saying, this is where my data lives. Uh, this is a key that I've used to, you know, so you sample one, sample two, model alpha, model beta. Um, and then an output directory for my plots. Uh, I compose and read the data, and then I uh, 
specify my output location. So that's typically uh, in, like I have my data and a plotting plots and data in two side-by-side uh, -side directories. And then for each key, which is a different lens on the data, perhaps it's a different sampling procedure, um, I have a subdirectory in the plots directory where all of the output from the plotting battery goes. And so here it's, it's simple. I produce a histogram and a scatter plot. And now I have two plots in that plotting directory. And when I want to compare different samples, uh, you know, ID'd on this key feature, I have a consistent visual language on which to evaluate differences. For example, if I have two different sets of users, recruiters and non-recruiters, and I want to look at their connection uh, activity, you can take these two uh, sets of plots and understand how they're different. Um, so that's, that's the basic, what I mean by a plotting battery. And then, of course, you have a shell script that calls this from the command line so you can just, whenever you downsample your data, roll up that shell script and now you have your plots. And so this is what I mean by latent and frictionless. Uh, so with respect to feature development, I think, you know, I, it is like a guilty secret. I, I know I hesitate to call it a guilty pleasure because it's worrisome. Uh, but a lot of times people uh, out of convenience may be tempted to just run features that they assume are normally distributed or reasonably distributed through statistical models uh, without really understanding how they're, how they're structured. Um, and I, you know, Anscombe's Quartet is this canonical example of why that's just not a good idea. These summary st the summary statistics for all of these distributions are identical, but they have very different structure. And uh, this is, I think, very concisely captures the essential problem here. And so I'll touch on uh, what I think are the most important kinds of, so basically scatter plots for me are, uh, are very instructive. And, and just to, before I, I get into this, I want to, so I spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of late nights during my thesis work, worrying about how that 10% sample was affecting the statistical power of our analyses. It's like, well, what if the other 90% is of, of communication on Twitter just totally changes the picture of that uh, communication network? Um, and now that I'm on the other side of this, uh, working at LinkedIn, and I just have the data, I don't have to ask for more. I just have all of it, um, which is great. <laughs> um, I mean, this, this, it's basically not a problem. And so this is instructive for the effect of downsampling as well. Like, you, there's this tension, and you have to figure it out for yourself, uh, between load time and processing time. Like, if I want to take the log of every feature in a data frame or replace all of my NAs with zero, um, you know, that's, if I'm waiting 15 seconds, like, maybe, the delta between these two plots isn't really sufficient to warrant that overhead in terms of uh, operating in memory. And so uh, frequently you're just interested in the, how the distribution is structured. And so I, you know, start conservatively maybe is a, is a good heuristic. Uh, so the joint distribution of two features I think is uh, one of the most interesting things you can study when interrogating a system. Uh, and I, I, I like the metaphor of interrogation. It's sort of you hold it by the collar and say, like, tell me what you know. Um, and so I think a scatter plot is naturally a, a place to start with uh, when you're trying to understand the joint distribution. But you have this problem, of course, of overplotting, where you have occlusion between points. And they, I mean, it truly could be the case that 90% of the mass of this distribution is on that point. Like, that's possible. And there's no way to tell if that's the case here or not. Um, and so as uh, a tick box in support of ggplot as the correct approach, all of the plots that I'm about to show uh, are based on uh, the same or very similar, uh, 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 basically an underlying data object. So I mean, I imagine quite a few of you use ggplot. But for those who don't, um, truly all you're changing for each to regenerate each of these plots is the line that you see to the right. Uh, so one effective technique for dealing with overplotting is to use the alpha parameter which changes, uh, basically you have to have here in this case five points all stacked on top of each other for you to have perfect, uh, opa like just no opacity in the point. And so you can begin to see there's this horizontal banding and you get a, a more fine grained picture of the distribution. But this is still somewhat unsatisfying. Um, and so I uh, tend to use heat maps a lot 
And this is, I mean, so one of the problems that you see with scatter plots is that if I have more than 100,000 points, your, your work, your environment basically grinds to a halt. And so heat maps scale very effectively. If I'm looking at 10 or 20 million points, uh, and especially with these long tail distributions, you can really get out into uh, the sort of vanishing structure of the distribution. And you begin to see here the uh, number of points in a given bin, of course, is mapped to a color scale. Um, you begin to see that the, the structure in the Z space of that PDF. Uh, PDF. Um, and there, you know, it, it's important to be aware of how different color scales affect our perception, um, especially with respect to categorical data. Um, and I mean, there, I think there are strong arguments for uh, the case that you really should use opacity um, in, a, in a, a context like this to, to better uh, differentiate. Because the, which one of these two points maps to which point on that plot or on, on that legend is not clear to me. And so there are drawbacks here as well. Uh, if you're interested in two different classes, and for example, the problem of distinguishing between two classes, um, using color to, uh, to accomplish this goal is, I mean, the obvious, the obvious thing to do. And what's great about ggplot2 is that you're simply taking a categorical variable and you're mapping it onto the aesthetic mapping. And the same uh, syntax now gives you this distribution between these two, point, these two uh, types of points. And we see here that there's you know, a, lot, a generally positive relationship between the number of connections a person has and their, page, their endorsement page, page rank in the endorsements network. Um, but it's hard to tell whether the uh, PDFs for these two different classes of individuals are distinct. And so uh, a view that I like on the data, and I'm, I'm becoming a much uh, more, and I'm becoming more enthusiastic about it, is the, are these density plots, which are basically the contours of the PDF, uh, like a topographic map, where the value of the distribution function along each line is constant. And so here we see that in the negative class, uh, users, the correlation coefficient is much lower. Uh, and in the positive class, you, you see a somewhat uh, meaningful correlation between connection count and endorsement page rank. And so a hypothesis that shakes out of this is that the people in the positive class are more effective at uh, turning potential social capital into actual social capital in the form of endorsements. And so this now is an insight into the behavior of the system. If you're plotting it as a scatter plot, it is useful to project the marginal histograms onto uh, the non-tick uh, mark axes. And I mean, if you search for mar marginal histograms, I'm going to I have, I'm going to put together a blog post that captures some of these uh, sort of features, and you can come back to the blog in a couple days, and I'll have this, uh, this code available. But if you search for ggplot2 marginal histogram, you're going to see code that does this. Uh, and it's, I think, a very useful lens on the data. And you can see that with respect to this dimension, we don't have much separation between these two uh, classes. But with respect to this dimension, we do. And this isn't, none of this is statistically significant necessarily but it's an intuition for how the data is structured. There's another really useful tool for R called GG, uh, GG pairs. And so Hadley Wickham uh, has basically absolved himself of his responsibility for plot matrix. He says it's just a, a broken framework and that GG pairs is the correct way to produce scatter plot matrices uh, using ggplot2. And so I'm not going to go into uh, there's a very co uh, coherent structure to this, to this plot, and it warrants uh, checking out the library. But basically, it's a way to look at all of the relationships um, and all of the histograms with respect to categor categorical variables uh, in a very co uh, sort of concise way. So GG pairs, it's, it's great. So um, model fitting and evaluation is the next step of the pipeline. So I, I basically, I hope I've made the case that like, it is very easy using this, this visualization battery paradigm and tools like ggplot2 to create plots uh, that give you deep insight into the structure of your data for very low marginal cost. And it's important to do. Uh, 
once you have features that you like and you've taken them and you've transformed them and you say, oh, well, this, this feature that was useless for my regression initially is now log normally distributed. Okay, I've, I've treated the data and it is now in the form that I'd like to use. Uh, you, of course, can produce uh, ROC curves and, I mean, there are a number of plots uh, for supervised learning applications um, that I think fall under the same aegis as the uh, statistical plots we've just gone through. So I'm going to focus on this, in this section, on uh, approaches for unsupervised learning. Um, and a paradigm that we see again and again at LinkedIn is, so like a lot of the most interesting questions that you can ask or try to, most of the interesting inferences you can try to make about a person or organization or relationship are not uh, well defined. There's not the class label that is the ground truth for what, I mean, there, you know, there are a number of things that we might want to know about people that aren't well defined in the data, but for which we can uh, look at different sources of truth. Uh, you, I mean, one thing you might imagine us asking is, is this person interested in recruiting? Whether or not they have a recruiter subs uh, subscription, you might say, where in the data can I get insight into the characteristic that uh, describes recruiting activity? Um, and there are a number of different ways you might operationalize that, and so frequently we will have, for a given problem statement, different training data uh, that operationalize that in, in slightly different ways, and then we're using um, multiple different models to treat this data, and so you have these pairs of training data, uh, mo like basically data model pairs, um, for which it, there's not one objective uh, correct answer, which is, oh, here's my accuracy on this model, on, on this pair is X, but we want, where we want to evaluate uh, each of these in, in concert. And so you, you apply the same visualization battery to each of the pairs, and that lets you uh, evaluate them on a common footing and make a more informed decision in the presence of uncertainty. Uh, so touching on unsupervised learning and visualization techniques for unsupervised learning, this is an amazing uh, network visualization that just came out a couple days ago uh, from the Stanford Machine Learning Coursera course. And so they have 40,000 submissions. And the problem is, how do we provide meaningful feedback? So they, of course, they unit test all of the submissions. And that's how they, they grade them. But they want to provide more meaningful feedback to students. And so what they do is they parse the submissions into abstract syntax trees, which represent the fundamental structure of the code. They then look at the edit distance between all pairs of syntax trees and define a distance metric that allows them to induce a network structure. And here you see all of the different ways that you might answer the questions that they're posing in the homework. And so I think what their plan is, uh, and so the color here corresponds, I believe, to performance on the unit tests uh, rather than network uh, cluster, is to cluster this network and identify representative uh, homework submissions from each community and write uh, feedback that can be applied to all of the members of that community. And I mean, this is beautiful and transformative for a lot of reasons. Like, this is how you scale massively online learning. Um, but it's also instructive from an unsupervised learning uh, perspective because the quality of your fit. There, I mean, there are a lot of different ways to slice a network, you know, and you can get, you can induce all of these different partitions, and visualizing it is really the only way to understand whether you have captured the network structure effectively uh, or whether you have some degenerate case. You can imagine with label propagation. Uh, when we, were, we performed label propagation on, our, on the polarized network, it would sometimes be the case that one uh, community would come to dominate the entire graph. And it's only through visualization, well, I mean, visualization makes that very obvious. And so you can use that to, to interrogate uh, network clustering algorithms. Here's another excellent uh, solution for the problem of understanding topic models. Uh, so I think the sort of worst case scenario is you have a list of terms and their loadings. Uh, I, I 
they typically use uh, latent semantic analysis, and you just have a list of uh, the vector loadings, and that's just useless. Um, a lot of people use word clouds. I, I think word clouds are actually pretty good. I know they get a lot of grief. Um, I, I like word clouds. Uh, but this is a very effective solution, I think, um, where you have topic by word, uh, a topic by word matrix, and the size of this uh, circle is the amplitude of that term with respect to that latent feature. And uh, when we permute the uh, rows of this matrix, you see the cluster structure emerge. And so Im you can imagine that the extent to which this is well uh, sort of uh, tight, these, these rows are tightly coupled, uh, will tell you how, like, how coherent this topic is. And it also lets you, I think you can, I, th I believe this is an interactive visualization, you can mouse over each of the topics and it will highlight in red the, the terms from that topic. And so I think here you uh, find a way to understand, I mean, I do, really the, the holy grail for topic modeling is to be able to do text summarization. But in the absence of this, I think visualization gives you a lot of leverage on the problem of understanding what the gist of a topic is about. Uh, so, so this problem of having ranked lists of terms or companies or real estate uh, locations or, in our case, members, uh, is, is pretty uh, common. And so we are, when we produce these models, constantly evaluating lists of members sorted according to some feature. And I think before, you know, before I came to LinkedIn, the, uh, the paradigm that was, was commonly playing out was that you would get a list and you would look at uh, a random assortment of observations from the top of the list and you would use our, our internal tool for looking at member profiles one at a time, our customer service tool. Uh, and then you would look at the middle of the list and the bottom of the list. And you assume that what you understand, uh, you hope that it holds for the other 200 and change million people. Um, and so this is a, a poor workflow paradigm. I think that viewer apps like this, so this is only internally uh, available, we, that a viewer app like this, this is a, just a card, but I, I consider this information visualization. And you are concisely summarizing the key attributes about a person. Um, and here you take uh, the distribution, you bin it into evenly spaced quantiles, and then you sample a random set of members from each quantile. And this allows you to step through the distribution and understand how the qualitative character of people changes with respect to a quantitative feature. And so in looking where, if you're doing this in a one-off fashion, you sort of lose uh, context as you switch between individuals. Here you're able to see uh, everything about a group of people, and you're able to develop a, a deeper understanding of how um, the qualitative character of these people changes. And so I think that um, web-based internal viewer apps are a very important part of the LinkedIn data, data science, I mean, just our engineering ecosystem. Uh, and this is a very effective way to communicate the results of machine learning to uh, product managers, um, and it also gives you a, a very clear sense, you know, as we're looking at these training data model pairs, is this one working? Is this operationalizing what I care about? Is this one doing better? Uh, this is a very effective way to do that. And I think it's a very general pattern. So the workflow principles that I think really characterize uh, what we're trying to do here are that information visualization should be latent and pervasive, so very frictionless, make it as easy for yourself as possible, and that involves uh, creating utility libraries to produce common statistical plots and making it very repeatable. Uh, mod, I mean, modular, this just descends from software architecture principles, uh, in that you should be able to swap in new data sets, whether it's your CSV or a data frame or your workspace file or whatever, uh, and just throw it up against your visualization battery and have it perform uh, as expected. And that it should, your battery should produce uh, consistent visual language so that you can use that tacit knowledge that you develop in the course of working with the data uh, to evaluate different models and data sets on common footing. Uh, what time is it? 7.40. 7 How much time do I have? Uh, okay, cool. We're, we're on track. So that's sort of 
what I have to say about machine learning. Uh, the other component of information visualization for large-scale computing is workflow management. I, I feel like this is a very underexplored space. Um, there is nothing about downsampling onto my machine uh, that is desirable. It is a, uh, a matter of necessity. There are, I know, I realize that there are tools that are trying to make it um, easier to visualize data on the grid at scale, um, but the reality is that they're just, there's just not a good solution. Uh, that being said, it would, the ideal scenario is one in which we can understand the structure of our data as it moves through a processing pipeline without having to downsample. Um, in addition, understanding how a workflow is progressing um, is a very important problem. And we have some tools that are open source at LinkedIn that make managing your workflows much easier. So this is a screenshot from a tool called Azkaban. And so this, this is in the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, you can imagine that workflows are basically directed as cyclic graphs. That's you're taking a piece of data, performing a transformation on it, a filter, a join, whatever, and then taking the output from that step and applying another transformation to it. And so you can define this dependency graph um, as a coherent workflow that is composed of individual MapReduce tasks. And then you can, I mean, this is a job scheduler. I, I, I realize Uzi, you know, this is one of many, many job schedulers for Hadoop. Um, but I think Azkaban wins the day in terms of like your ability to instrument and control your workflows. So the ability to see which jobs are running, which have failed, and which, is, which have succeeded, that's, 80% of the problem right there. Uh, I can right click on this node and restart that task. And this node will wait until all of its parents have completed uh, to continue executing. And so without having to parse through log file, I mean, <laughs> you've seen the task tracker. It, it's awful. Um, this lets you um, understand how your workflow is progressing. And I mean, you know, like I think a lot of people like who are, uh, you know, I did this for many years, like, you know, cron jobs and bash scripts and getting structure around uh, how you organize your workflows, I mean, is, is truly transformative. And the ability to see how they're progressing is fundamental uh, to doing this stuff effectively. Additionally, we have another tool called White Elephant that lets you look at, I mean, so multi-tenancy is sort of the rule, the, the law of the land at LinkedIn. You are competing with a lot of algorithms. Uh, for finite uh, cluster resources. And I think that characterizes a lot of computing environments. I mean, every computing environment, let's be realistic. Um, and so what White Elephant does is let you see over time how demand on the grid is peaking and ebbing and flowing, basically. Um, and then you can stratify that by user or job or what have you. And so if, there's some, if you suspect somebody is writing data to temp and it's just bringing everything to a grinding halt, you can go in and see, okay, when is, when is demand spiking and who's responsible for this? Um, additionally, from a business perspective, being able to attribute uh, cost to uh, algorithms in a grid computing environment is very important. And so understanding what proportion of your resources are being utilized and what your return on investment is, um, is a very powerful way to make decisions in the presence of finite resources. And so, um, you know, it doesn't have to be this. You know, I, I built, um, using an Arduino uh, and a set of addressable LEDs, a little light bar that shows what proportion of mappers and reducers are currently being utilized. You know, it truly can be anything. Um, but getting visibility into the workflows, um, I think, is, is a really important part of the job. And I think there's just a lot of upside. I mean, you, you know, there you, see, you look at, the, at a job tracker and you have that little histogram of how many of your mappers and reducers have completed, and that's great, but you know, the rest of it is HTML tables. Like, there's a lot of upside here. Um, Netflix is doing, uh, I haven't used this platform specifically, but I really like uh, how it looks. Um, this will take a pig script, it's called Lips, Lipstick, so lipstick on a pig. Um, it will take a pig script and decompose it into its functional operations and visualize. So each 
blue bin here is an individual uh, job. And then the, uh, I mean, it's, it's a lot like Illustrate. But Illustrate isn't that great. This is a way to, you, I mean, if you've ever had to come in and like debug somebody else's pics, you've got 120 lines and all of your you know, generate statements are on one line. You're just like, what the hell is going on here? Like this lets you see uh, what the code is doing. And so tools like this, I think, uh, are very powerful. And so I, ha I think I've got maybe 10 more minutes. Is that competing with Q&A? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of the other tools. And these are, these are not LinkedIn tools, these are just in the ecosystem that I like. And so you may find them interesting too. So Tableau is pretty great. Um, it is what it is in a lot of respects. You know, it, it doesn't scale as well for some problems as I might like, um, but it is, uh, so for the decision sciences, they, they do analytics and reporting and uh, manage a lot of our A-B testing infrastructure uh, at LinkedIn Data Science. It is a great way to communicate your results. And it really, you know, so my father wrote his thesis using punch cards. And like he tells me about this and it's just like, I literally can't imagine. Um, and I will tell my children what it was like writing scripts to join dictionaries by their keys and it's just gonna be like, what? And Tableau, it's like, that's it. And it's not the future, but it's in that direction. Uh, so, and it's free. You can, the Tableau public for a lot of data sets is very powerful and the ability to just sort of like make it rain with your scatter plots, like it's, it's great. Um, there is an R uh, library coming out that looks very exciting. Um, and it's still somewhat primitive, but it, the, the concept is quite powerful, called Shiny, that lets you, oh, well, actually, I won't be showing you how it looks, um, but it lets you do uh, interactive visual analytics uh, in a way that is tied to a data frame. And it's a web server uh, that runs and connects to an R session, and it lets you facet, and it's driven by ggplot2. And so you can change the type of plotting you do. I mean, it basically instruments the grammar of graphics in an inter interactive way. It's a very powerful idea. It's built by the guys who, run, who develop RStudio. It's early software, but it's going to be great. Uh, Google Viz is a library for R that lets you uh, compile against the Google plotting, Google Charts library, I believe. Um, so here, you know, Google Motion Charts are, I think some of you may have seen that uh, report on, um, well, I'm totally blanking on his name. But basically, life expectancy. Oh, nice yes, Hans Rosling. Um, very inspiring uh, talk. Uh, this is a way to recreate that kind of plot, which is this scatter plot with size mapped points uh, moving in time. Uh, this is one of the kinds of charts that you can generate if you just hook up. You don't have to write any JavaScript code. And so that's, that's pretty powerful. You can just generate these Google charts um, using R. Additionally, if you're in the market to teach yourself ggplot, uh, there's a great tool that I, in putting together this talk, came across um, from UCLA, our web stat, UCLA, EDU, ggplot2, that lets you look at a code window um, and like Tableau, say, I want my X to be this feature, I want my Y to be this feature, map the point, uh, use this geometry, map the size to this attribute, um, and it will generate ggplot objects for you, and you can look at the code and it's a great way to learn the library. Uh, Adobe Color is an excellent tool for picking uh, visually coherent uh, spectra or website colors or whatever. Um, it's just a great tool. And it, you know, I mean, there's, you can slice it a lot of different ways. Uh, likewise, Color Brewer, especially for mapping applications, uh, is an excellent tool for selecting colors and it lets you say, I want to represent divergent data or sequential data. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's great. D3, obviously, dominant paradigm. Uh, you were just saying that, is it R charts? Yes. R charts lets you generate D3 plots according to a grammar uh, from R, 
Wait, so I, I don't like coding JavaScript. It's one of my least favorite things to do. Um, and uh, the but I love D3. I just I, you know I just want it. And so the idea the, just today I learned about this. The idea of being able to generate D3 from R is very exciting to me. Um, and obviously you know so Mike Bostock, who is the graphics editor for the New York Times, um, has this what what are called Bostock's blocks. Um, these D3 examples. And it's just hundreds of these things. Um, and it's uh, a really useful code library that is, um, I mean, it's visual. You, you see what it is that he's doing, and you can inspect the source, and he has the code sample. And it's a very, uh, it's a very useful tool, for D, a lot resource for D3 developers. Um, the map set from Stamen, this is, I don't know, I think this is maybe a year and a half, two years old. Um, this is a tile set for Google Maps that just, it's beautiful, like this, this one particularly is just awesome. And so it uses OpenStreetMaps. So it's not for Google Maps, it's for OpenStreetMaps. Um, and it's just gorgeous. And in so much as communicating elegantly is a priority, I think that this is an excellent paradigm. Um, and so, I mean, Stamen does great work. Um, and so you can combine D3 and these, these maps uh, to get, I mean, this, this is a beautiful, piece of visualization um, from the guys at Zipfian Academy, uh, which is a local data science boot camp. Um, and this takes health inspection data, you know, these open public records, and plots in an interactive way where the most inveterate health offenders are in the city uh, and where it's clean to eat. Um, and it also, so it communicates a lot, um, not only the magnitude and presence of restaurants, but also like where the problems are. And this, kind of uh, mashup, I think, is very powerful. And it, we have, in, in some measure, a lot of opportunity as people who have faculty with these skills to communicate meaningful results uh, for the public good. Uh, and I think that this is a great example of, of exactly that. Um, so that's kind of what I have to say about visualization. Uh, I think that we are in a very privileged position um, you know, I think it's important to be pragmatic about the hype curve and where, uh, where the value add is for a lot of this stuff. Um, but I also think that it is difficult to overstate how transformative uh, this science is. I mean, you, you look at I mean, the, the history of information um, as a resource and from the printing press to the networked information economy through to grid computing and the ability to aggregate and combine data sets in a way that is truly unprecedented. I mean, we are studying society as though a cell. And I think that that is very exciting. For me, it's a beautiful experience. And it's a statistically powerful experience. And I think that there's a lot of upside. And I'm, I'm glad we're a part of it. This is a great time to be here. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for the time. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, I'm a priest. Um, I'm involved at, uh, a lot at eBay, and we have big volumes, big data, oh, yeah. that stuff. Yeah. And what visualization for us is really trying to find a, find a signal in the noise. And I saw that you had you use multiple tools, and what drives you to change tools between that much? Is it because one tool does not show you the signal you're looking for, and, or it's harder to show it to your end user? Sure. Is so, that, that's basically why? So the, the question is why uh, the ecosystem of tools. So those la that last series of tools, I have not used all of those, just to be totally clear. Um, and I think you, you basically hit on the, the principal point is that many of the uh, design affordances of these visualization libraries are limited and don't fully capture, you know, a heat map is different from a scatter plot, but they're not, um, there is information contained in a scatter plot that isn't represented in the heat map. And so in the same way that two different charts can give you a different lens on the 
texture of this high dimensional structure, um, different libraries uh, afford you the same kinds of uh, insights. And I think also just some of it is technical uh, pragmatism. It, some of this stuff is just hard to instrument, hard, uh, the tooling isn't that great, the, you know, it's buggy, um, whatever. I mean, just difficult to develop with. Um, and so it, it really is kind of like, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, you got to get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. So I noticed a lot of your graphs were two dimensional. Do you mm -hmm. find any value in three dimensional visualizations? I actually, so um, my instinct is to say no. Um, and then I pause and I think, well, maybe there's an example that I can think of of an effective three dimensional visualization. And I'm realizing now that I can't think of any effective three dimensional visualizations. Um, well, so that's, that's a projection. So I, I think that that's three dimension, three variables represented. The question is about the contour maps. And so that's representing a three dimensional surface. But I think what you're touching on is like network diagrams where you're taking like a projection for suit, like where there's actually a coordinate basis for the points. I mean, we, you know, until we have stereoscopic displays, I don't think that that's going to be really useful. I think it confuses people too. I'm, I'm, I, want, I want it to happen. I want that to be my life. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the back. Oh, with respect to animation. Um, I mean, like, it, uh, I think with temporally evolving phenomena, animation makes a lot of sense. Um, there, so we shared a, some academic family, and when I first uh, worked with Kati Borner at IU, um, she said, you know, we have this data set, uh, what would you like to do with it? And I had this, you know, multifaceted, like, you know, it would change, and she was like, she was flabbergasted, because she was like, everybody does this. You say, what do you want to make? And they just, the all singing, all dancing, it's moving, it's like doing everything. And I think um, animation very much breaks in that direction where it's like, the, I mean, it's sort of like um, the false positive problem. You know, it's like the rule is generally that you don't need to animate your data unless you have very, very good reason to do so. Um, because it, it typically, I think, uh, serves even, even the, it's not clear to me, and I say this in a somewhat uninformed way, that that Hans Rosling plot could not be done better, uh, that animation is a crucial element of that plot. Yes, please. Uh, so you had mentioned JavaScript is one of your favorite languages. So um, <laughs> I've done a little bit of D3 with JavaScript. Yep. I'm just wondering, based on your experience with it, um, working with D3, what would you say is sort of your upper limit in terms of a threshold, in terms of how many nodes and links that you can actually get rendering into the browser? What kind of performance you see? The, the last time I was doing networks in D3, it was about 600 points. Um, and I mean, like, it's like my machine can probably handle more than that. Um, <laughs> got nice computers. Um, but if you're developing for people who are working on laptops, um, I don't know what mobile support is like. Um, you know, it's, you're probably pretty um, limited in the number of points you can display. Yeah, I mean, like, and, right, you know, and, right, and sort of like a lot of the interesting structure, unless you're doing like aggregation, like multi-level, like you're clustering and then you're saying, okay, this represents this set of points. Um, I don't know that you get a lot of interesting network features with, at that scale. If you did have thousands of data points that you wanted to illustrate, what would be a good way of breaking it up or chunking it up to, to show in the browser? So one, uh, I think, I don't, I don't know what, a, what an answer to that question that isn't overly general sounds like. Use the different tools, the different libraries. There are libraries that are scaling better because generally in D3 you're going to render it to SVG. That's what a lot of people do, which is just not very performant if you're, like, as you're saying, a few hundred. There are, there are other libraries like Sigma, Sigma JS or something like that. It renders on the canvas. And there's always a, a, yeah. a trade off between capabilities you get. Like you can't move nodes around anymore, but you really need to. Yeah. So, so is Canvas limited in the sense that you can't? interact with it as much as you can with this. Right, because Canvas is like a bitmap, like pixel right, oriented. Right. Yeah. And that's like the crucial component, right, is that details on demand. Like show me who, and it's like these people at the interact, in the, at the interface between those two 
uh, political communities, it took us a very long time to like say, what is this guy's Twitter handle? You know, because we were plotting these pings, and it's like, it's just hard. Was that a target in the browser? No, that was uh, Network X. Yeah. Was there a question in the back? No? Like, if we're running thin on time, like. All right. I have a question. Wow. If you have if you have these abstract uh, systems that are dealing with histograms or or heat maps, you're doing binning. How do you deal with the problems that binning creates in your data? Um, so are you just to make sure that I answer your question, can you clarify like what kinds of problems you have in mind? Uh, so if you have two outliers uh, and you've been on uh, like yeah. on quantiles, like how, are you, how do you deal with the outline? So this, I think, like one of the things that I really like about our studio and MATLAB, but you know, it's free, um, is this ability to like have the, the matrix in memory. And so, I mean, and this is, I mean, classic, like as you course in your resolution of your, your histogram, uh, you, you get less of that like jaggedness. Um, and there's this trade-off between the, re the resolution and the, how much you can see, uh, and how, basically, I mean, the, I'm not using the right words. But you, I mean, do you know what I'm talking about? Where the smaller the bins, the more of the shape of the distribution you see, but it, eventually you reach this resolution limit where you see like statistical noise and you have very jagged bins. Um, that, I don't think there is one representative histogram. You know, there's a probability density function that we are sampling from and trying to estimate, and so like, Taking a sort of like parameterized approach where you have different smoothing coefficients, I think is kind of how I, I deal with that problem where it's like, there's not the one, you know, I flip back and forth between representations because there's not like the one true plot. And so this is that mental model stuff. Like, um, you know, and then also another problem that you see with, with binning is that, for example, with power law distributed features, um, uniformly spaced bins uh, are not are not appropriate, and so generally your histogram tools are going to do you right. But it's important to be aware of like when logarithmically spaced bins are the right tool for the job, and so it's sort of that like you know multiple different perspectives, but also sensitivity to the statistical needs of the data. So do you build that uh, those, all of those perspectives all into that one battery? Uh, like n no, typically. So the battery, like I will work in memory to identify, certain, you know, it's like, I mean, it's a sort of overused metaphor, but detective work in a, in a sense, where you're like, I think that this feature needs to be normalized in this way. Um, and once I have a clear sense for what the lens is, I'll standardize it and like introduce it to the battery. So it's like interactive, iterative feature development, then put it in the battery so that it's every time I can just run it. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any uh, customer-facing statistics presented that might need visualization? I mean, when I think of my LinkedIn page, yeah. the only thing I can think of is a, a number of connections. It's not terribly, yeah. terribly robust. So I think that there is, um, we are, I will take this opportunity, we are hiring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm working with some of our design team uh, and product design people uh, to make, you know, you want to have uh, professional intelligence and like insight into the structure of your network and others' network I think is a very valuable uh, proposition for LinkedIn users. And I think visual analytics and statistical summaries that are meaningful, that are non-technical, um, there's a lot of upside there. Um, and I think we can do a better job and that we, we hope to. Uh, but at present, I mean, you know, we have some visualizations like how many common connections you have. Um, but the, the potential is, is very large. And so just to, to clarify on the hiring point, like we are looking for uh, junior and senior developers, independent contributors um, with strong engineering background. Uh, so basically, we hire along three dimensions. You need uh, machine learning chops, engineering cred, and product sense. And you need to be pretty good in all three and great in one. And that, that one is really engineering and machine learning. Um, we're hiring interns. Uh, we're probably looking at having an intern work on a visualization project like this. We've got graph analytics problems. I mean, it's just 
everything. You know so much about so many interesting perspectives on the economy. And so if you're interested in working with great people on interesting problems, uh, I'll give you my card. But we're, to your point, we're, we're, it, we can do better, and we're going to do better. Yeah, to some extent. I mean, it, you know, they, um, what's that? Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. You know, I, I think people may need to, if you need to leave, feel free to do so. <laughs> um, and there was another question. Um, I can't really talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, fully. I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. And I just, I think it's useful to just, there's a lot of, um, it can seem very complex when people write about this stuff. And like, frankly, a lot of it is pretty simple. Like, just give me a, unif like a uniform binning histogram across every feature in my data set that is not categorical. Like, that is just a useful thing to do. And like, most of it may not be interesting, but like, paging through that set of plots at least once, yeah, I mean, it, it really is that simple. And then it's that iterative process where you're like, oh, I need to drill into this feature, and I can ignore these 10. Yeah. Let's call it, guys. Let's, let's do this. I appreciate your time. And I mean, the venue, this is, this is it, guys. SF Data Mining. <laughs>